You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 88. What is the spiritual body Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15? I'm your layman, Trey Strickland. He's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Very good, very good. Did you have a good week? I did, and you? Busy, you know, but uh, yeah, a good week. Well, good. Just, uh, you know, a lot to do as usual, but that's a good thing. So yeah. I can't uh, can't complain about, I'm not never bored. Well, what's the spiritual body Paul's talking about? Yeah, this is kind of an odd, uh, odd sort of topic. I, I think people will find it interesting because of its connections back uh, into the Old Testament. And, you know, when we when we uh, think of spiritual body, we, we probably think of something like a disembodied spirit form, even though, I, you know, I use the word disembodied there. But when we see the word spirit or, or spirit body or spiritual body, we don't think of something corporeal like you could touch. But, you know, the, that that's actually what Paul is getting at. We're, we're going to go through a lot of uh, source references for this topic, because there are roots to this in both the Old Testament, again, for to, to create that, that Jewish context, that Israelite, you know, Hebrew Bible context for this. And then also in Paul's own day on the Gentile side, the Greco-Roman side, there is actually a considerable amount of, of literature in, in terms of ancient texts where writers talk about, for lack of a better way of putting it, what the gods are made of. You know, like because they 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 appear in bodily form and have really cool hair or really big muscles or whatever it is, but they're made of something, and a lot of their terminology overlaps with what Paul is using. But again, within the biblical context, what Paul is is saying is very consistent with something specific in the Old Testament. That's kind of kind of cool, and I think has some real theological significance to it. So let's just jump into it to sort of set up. The topic in Paul's day, Gentiles, again, Greco Roman culture there, and Jews both believed that gods had bodies. Now, we've talked about this a lot before. Again, Unseen Realm, I talk a little bit about it. I've, I've given other you know, lectures, alluded to things in, in podcast episodes about the fact that, hey, even the God of the Old Testament is embodied, okay, in, in certain passages. So that wasn't a new concept. It's not strange at all to their ear. But when it Ancient people are thinking of that. They're not thinking of bodies made of flesh and blood. They're also not thinking that the gods were just only spirits. Okay, they were certainly spirit beings, but when they interacted with people on earth, they took form. They took physical form. Uh, it wasn't flesh and blood, it was something else. Okay, they were made of something superior to flesh and blood, had different properties to it. So they, both Gentiles and Jews had, again, these conceptual categories for embodied deities, okay, divine beings that could, were also corporeal in some sense, or could do that at will. That was just, again, one of their attributes, one of their properties. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 15 and you know a few other places points, again, to his belief. You know, it, it draws on, on his belief about embodied deity. Let's just put it that way. But it, it, it does more than that. It also points to his belief that Christians would one day share that stuff that gods are made of. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they, they would share that corporeal form that Yahweh took upon himself back in Genesis 18 or Ezekiel 1, uh, where God is depicted as a man. We're, we're going to be, be looking at Ezekiel 1 more closely. Uh, that Christians would, would, would have that. And, and that stuff is, the, is also the stuff that Christ's resurrection body was made of. So at some point, Christians are going to put on that stuff, that that is what, what we're going to be. They would have the same sort of body. So in other words, in the resurrection, you know the the the, the resurrection, the, the 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 final day, the the, the final you know form of, of of the kingdom. It's not just going to be a bunch of spirits run, you know floating around or anything like that. There's going to be again glorified believers who are going to have bodies that share the same stuff as the resurrected Christ body, and even as of God Himself when God chose to be embodied. Uh, in the Old Testament. It would be incorruptible. 
but it would be corporeal in some sense as well. Now, at times during the episode, and I'll try to remember to, to telegraph this specifically, uh, I'm going to be quoting from uh, what I think is probably the, the best book on this subject. And it's, it's a recent scholarly work. The dissertation is not available, or else I would have included it in the bibliography, the Divine Council bibliography. That is not available in PDF, so we really only have the book, and the book's expensive. Uh, the book is called, uh, it, it's by a guy named M. David Litwa, that's L-I-T-W-A, and the book is called We Are Being Transformed. Subtitle is Deification in Paul's Soteriology. And for those not familiar with the term soteriology, that's Paul's doctrine of salvation. So the doctrine of salvation goes from you know conversion all the way up to glorification in traditional theology classes. And so Litwa's book is, again, about the whole, not, not, not the whole scope, but specifically the deification element, the glorification element. And he has a full chapter on the bodies of gods uh, in both Jewish texts, Greco-Roman texts, and he has a few other chapters that sort of build off that one. So he, he probably devotes 50, 60, 70 pages to this spiritual body concept, which is more than I've you know, seen anyone else do. And, and again, it was this was published in 2012, so it's very current with the literature as well. So I would recommend it. Again, it, it's pricey, and I don't really have a way to, to get you the dissertation that this uh, was based on. Let me just take a look here, I, because I think it is actually the published version of a dissertation. Well, it's actually not. It's just, it's just a monograph. So it's something he's been working on for a while. So that would explain why it's not in the dissertation database. But again, if you want the book, you're going to have to get the book. And it's, it's the best thing on the topic, but it's pricey. Again, I'll be honest with you. So let's talk a little bit about Paul uh, in, in context. And we'll begin with the Greco-Roman idea, that's sort of the Gentile context. Then I'll, I'm going to start there and then go to the, the Old Testament Israelite thinking on this. Again, in antiquity, in the Greco-Roman religions, Greco-Roman thinking, that their gods would have bodies uh, would not have been an unusual thought. It's, it's something they would have been accustomed to. There are a number of, of passages that really almost any deity figure you could pluck out of Greco-Roman uh, classical material is going to have some sort of physical description. Aphrodite, for instance, is said to have been born from the immortal flesh or skin of Uranus. Okay. Uranus is the Greek word for the heavens, heavenly one. Again, it's a, it's a deity name in, in uh, Hesiod, in his Theogony and other Greek literature. Uh, but you know, Aphrodite is born from this immortal flesh, you know, quote unquote, immortal flesh. Gods could get wounded. They they did and could they could and did bleed if they were in, in battle or wounded, but but they did their blood wasn't blood wasn't human blood it was something uh, called ichor which was described as immortal blood so again it, it, it's something different you know the gods just have these sort of physical properties uh, they they could be depicted again in physical form often were and that was because they were thought to actually have. Uh, some sort of embodiment, some sort of corporeality, particularly and especially when they were interacting in human affairs with with humans, with people. Now, on the Israelite side, again, we've talked about this at length, the, the idea of divine embodiment. I've referenced, uh, for instance, Benjamin Sommer's book called The Bodies of God, uh, where this, this is the book that I think is especially important because he shows that in Israelite thinking and in wider ancient Near Eastern thinking, the gods could exist in more than one form simultaneously. And this is Benjamin Summer. He teaches at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's a Jew. And he'll say things directly, explicitly in his book, like, hey, that Christian idea of a trinity, yeah, the Hebrew Bible can certainly accommodate that. You know, and, and, and frankly, the wider ancient Near Eastern world knows of this concept as well. Now, now the words Summer will use to describe it is what Christ, we would call in Christian theology modalism, which isn't really what it's, – it's not fully what Trinitarianism is about. But again, that we can excuse Summer for that because he's a Jew and these, these are the words he prefers to use. But the idea that, that the gods could, again, be embodied – Summer's big on that. He has lots of evidence for it, both in the Hebrew Bible and outside the ancient Near East and other, other uh, ancient Near Eastern religions. And the gods who are embodied can be simultaneously embodied somewhere else as someone else or something else simultaneous to this other thing over here. I mean, it, again, that that's more – it's more awkward to, to put it that way, but that's more in keeping with what we think about as Christians as – as Orthodox Trinitarianism. But Summer's book is, is very useful for that. Now, Summer, 
And again, uh, Litwa, the, the book that we're referencing mostly today, sort of zero in at certain points on Ezekiel chapter one. So that's, that's where we're going to go. If you're following along, you, you could go to Ezekiel one. And specifically, let's start in verse 22. And of course, this is the the famous, you know, weird cherubim throne vision that Ezekiel has at the beginning of the book. And part of it reads like this. This is beginning in, in verse 22. Over the heads of the living creatures, of course, the living creatures we find out from 10 are, chapter 10, are cherubim, the four cherubim with, with the faces and all that. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystals spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another. Each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, they heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of the tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. In verse 25, And there came a voice from above the expanse, over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated Above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance, the form of a man. And upward from what they had, or from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. Downward from what had the appearance of his waist was the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of the rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Now, now catch this line. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Okay, that's that's from Ezekiel 1. Now, this glory idea is important because if, if you followed what I just read there, Ezekiel calls the figure, the human figure seated on the throne, he calls him the glory of the Lord. And Ezekiel actually uses that phrase, glory of the Lord, and also uses glory of the God of Israel in Ezekiel 9.3. So the glory the glory is not just a cloud in the Old Testament. That's how we think of it. We think of the glory cloud, the Shekinah glory cloud. That is not always the way the glory of the Lord is described. Sometimes the glory of the Lord is a man, is a human figure, a human form. Right here in Ezekiel 1, and of course, there's other places too. So the glory is a human figure seated on the throne. The glory has form. It's not just a light, and it's not just a formless spirit. It has form. Ezekiel can tell looking at it that it's a man. It has human bodily features. Okay. Now, to make the point in a different way, if you go to Ezekiel 10, 20 and compare that with Ezekiel 1, 22 and 28. In Ezekiel 1, the passage we just read, the cherubim are under the quote, glory of the Lord. If you go to Ezekiel 10, 20, the cherubim are said to be under the God of Israel. So again, the glory and the God of Israel are the same, and they have bodily form. They're embodied. So the glory isn't just light. It's not just a cloud. In the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord can speak of a bodily form. Now that's going to be backdrop to what Paul talks about, because Paul is not going to just use the phrase spiritual body. He's also going to use phrases like heavenly man, and he's, he's also going to use the, the word glory to describe this body in his own writings. So there's there's going to be a lot of Old Testament precedent for what we talk about in, in terms of what Paul was thinking here. There's also, again, broader Greco-Roman Gentile precedent for this as well, that gods can indeed have corporeal form, they can have bodily form, and actually be bodily. They are made of stuff when they interact with people. Okay, so that that's again the, the setup. Now I want to go to to Litwa's book here specifically on page one twenty six, and I'm going to read a, an excerpt here about some of the passages that Paul, where, where Paul actually references the glory. Now, in light of what I just talked about, in light of what we just explained, I think you're going to find some familiar passages from Paul that sort of take on new meaning. If you pardon the pun, they take on a different shape. You know, just listen to what, what Litwa says here. He says, turning to Paul, we note the, clo the close relation relationship excuse me, between Yahweh's glory, his glory body, and the kind of body Paul attributes to Christ. According to Paul, Christ has, quote, a 
body of glory. Soma tes dogzes in Philippians 3.21. Okay, so he actually says Christ has a body of glory. The glory here is probably a genitive of content or definition. In other words, the body constituted by glory, the, the, the body that is made up of glory. This is the body which Christ gained in his resurrection when he was raised by the, quote, glory of the Father. Okay, again, Paul actually says that in Romans 6. Okay, Romans 6, verse 4, we have this phrase, okay, that he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Accordingly, in 1 Corinthians, Christ is called, I'm reading Litwa again here, Christ is called the Lord of glory. When believers, quote, behold the glory of the Lord in 2 Corinthians 3.18, they appear to be beholding Christ himself, who is the image of God, 2 Corinthians 4.4. Colossians 1.15. Now, this is me now. Now, we've talked about divine imaging a lot being functional, okay? but we've also talked about both in Unseen Realm and, again, other podcasts and whatnot, lectures I've given, that humans not only were created as the image to be the representation of God, but humans actually are sort of the stand-in. They are, to you know, understand how, why I use this term, they are the idol of Yahweh. They are the physical representation as well of the God of Israel. This is why in Old Testament theology, idolatry was forbidden. You know, God says, don't make an image of, of you know, anything that you see in, in heaven and earth and all that, because I'm, I'm different from everything else. I'm unlike everything else. Well, that was part of the part of the issue. But And we, we, we brought this up in, in, at a few places in Leviticus too. Part of the rationale to not allowing an image to be created to to worship is that only Yahweh himself deserves worship but part of the rationale is that we already have an image of God we already have something physical that represents God and that is that's humans that's humanity it's us okay and so this this idea harkens back to Christ not only was Christ the perfect representative of God, he also is the representation of God in in the most literal sense possible in New Testament theology. Why? Because of the incarnation. So when Paul, again, returning back to Litwa, you know, we have when believers behold the glory of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18, they appear to be beholding Christ himself, who is the image of God. If Moses could not see the face of God, again, that's for that famous passage, Christians can see the glory of God in the face of Christ. And Paul actually uses that phrase too. In 2 Corinthians, again, 4, we have here you know, the reference to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's verse 4. And then in verse 6, for God said, let light shine out of darkness. The, the God who said, let shine, light shine, shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, in Hebrew, the, the, the face is panim. It refers to the presence, you know, being in the presence of someone else, not necessarily the thing that, you know, is supported by your neck, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It's not necessarily to be over-literalized anatomically. The idea is the Word was made flesh. The, God was made flesh. You, you, he, he lived and walked here on the earth, and, and, and the, it was Jesus Christ. So you have beheld the glory of God when you looked at this person. Again, and it's not that you know, in terms of sort of, you know, visible attractiveness or anything like that, the idea is that God was embodied. And in this case, it was even more than the embodiment that we know from the Old Testament. In this case, we have incarnation. And, and after the resurrection, we still have God embodied. But the nature of the body is different. Again, it's, it's this uh, corporeal stuff that transcends human flesh and blood. It, it's something, but it's different. Uh, it's it's corporeal, but it has different properties. And so what what Lit was saying here, I'll just finish with his, his this one sentence he has. This sort of language indicates that Paul understood the glory language of Exodus and Ezekiel to refer to a visible, luminous, divine corporality, and attributed this corporeality to Christ, who exists. Now he's going to quote in Philippians two six, who exists quote in the form of God. Okay. So again, very familiar passages there using glory and form and and even face and presence. But again, we, we tend to abstract these things only. 
It's not that they don't have a higher, more abstract meaning conceptually, because they do. But what Litwin is arguing for, based upon the Old Testament, again, where the glory has bodily form, bodily form, anthropomorphic bodily form. He's saying his argument is, look, when we read these passages in the New Testament, we need to be thinking not only of the abstract concepts they convey, but that God came to man corporeally. And whatever that was, whatever that stuff was, it was different from and transcendent from and superior to the form we have now. Uh, it's, it's this post-resurrection stuff, post-resurrection corporeality embodiment. And that is what we are going to inherit. He says, you know, Litwa's argument is in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is saying that stuff, we are going to inherit that. That is the kind of body that we are going to have. Now, again, there's there's more to this, as you, you could well imagine. If I go over to, uh, let's say, just another section here uh, in Litwa, the next, page 127, he writes, if glory is a way of referring to Christ's divine corporeality, how is it related to Christ as, quote, there's another description of Jesus, quote, the life-giving pneuma or the life, uh, the life-making pneuma, the life-giving spirit. Okay, that, you know, that, that's, that's also a reference to Jesus. And by the way, um, there, there are, are New Testament scholars that love to take this verse and, and deny the bodily resurrection. That would be co- totally contrary to the ancient mind. Okay, what, what we have here is, is we, have, we have the embodied Jesus post resurrection. Okay? It's not just a spirit. It's not like the Gnostics were saying, you know, the spirit of the Logos is floating around up there and this guy's still on the cross. You know, that isn't it. Okay. It's, it's not just spirit. It's not formless spirit in mind. It's something, it, it, it's flesh transcendent. Okay. It, it, it's flesh made into something superior to normal flesh. Okay. So anyway, Litwa writes, if glory is a way of referring to Christ's divine corporeality, how is it related to Christ as the life-making pneuma? Pneuma is the word for spirit, the life-giving spirit. Should we also conceive of the pneumatic, again, Christ, the spirit Christ, so to speak, in corporeal terms? Litwa says, there's some reason to think that this life-making spirit is a reference to Christ's physical constitution. This is because those conformed to the pneumatic Christ, and he's quoting here 1 Corinthians 15, 49. I want to pick up that verse here, so let me go to 1 Corinthians 15 and read that to you so you know where it's coming from. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 49. Let's go back up to 48. Uh, 47. Okay, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Verse 49, just as we have borne, we have borne, we have carried, okay, the image of the man of dust. Okay, this is what we're carrying around. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Okay, so what Lit was saying is, you know, th- this whole thing about Jesus having become a life-giving spirit, a life-giving enuma, elsewhere, The same person at the same time, again, post-resurrection, is referred to, again, as something that has human bodily form. So his argument is there's some reason to think that the life-giving pneuma is a reference to Christ's physical constitution. This is because those conformed to the pneumatic Christ are said to inherit a pneumatic body. And he quotes references there, 1 Corinthians 15.44, which says, talking about the, the body we have now, being sown in dishonor, it's going to be raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's going to be raised in power. Verse 44, our bodies now are sown a natural body, but it is raised as a spiritual body. So it's not a spiritual spirit. Okay. It's a spiritual body. And of course, this is the, the focus point of our whole episode here. And Litwa says, it appears then that Christians become like Christ by conforming to his heavenly body. So in other words, becoming like Christ in an eschatological sense is not just, oh, someday when we're in heaven, we won't sin anymore. You know, we, we won't react negatively. We won't have an impulse of rebellion. Uh, you know, and by the way, this is the answer for, hey, you know, if, if you know, 
you know, how about in all these angels, you know, they had free will and they were embodied, they came to earth and they were, hey, they were angels, but yet they sinned, you know, and like, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to inherit all that. So like in heaven, you know, are, are, are we going to sin, you know, and all, no, the, the answer is no, because we are going to be conformed. We are going to be imprints. We are going to be, again, to use a dumb word, clones. Okay, We're going to be made of that stuff that Jesus is made of. And not only made of that, but also this idea of being conformed to the image. We're going to become so like him that we behave and react like him. Okay, We are, we are, we are Christians in the truest sense that we are little Christs. Okay, And it's not that we have the same nature. It's not that we're eternal beings. We're not. We were created. It's not that we are we are fully what God is, or even fully what Christ is. The idea is that we will be so like Him, we were, we will be so conformed to the image that not only does it refer to inner impulses and again these abstract ideas we won't sin, but but what what you know Litwa's argument, what Paul is saying is that look, all this language about being conformed to the, to to Christ, you have to include in it that we are conformed to His heavenly body as well. And he goes on, he says, this is explicitly stated in Philippians 3.21, quote, he will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to his body of glory. And again, look, look at the words. The glory in the Old Testament, in certain texts, has bodily human form. So I'm going to read that again, Philippians 3.21. He will, God will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to his body of glory. Litwa says, what we learn in 1 Corinthians 15.45 is that Christ's body is not only a body of glory, but also a body of pneuma. So this idea of a spirit body is not a spirit spirit, okay? It's not formless. It's not energy. It's not light. Okay, it actually is some corporeal stuff, like Jesus had post-resurrection. Uh, again, it, it's a hard concept, you know, for us to wrap our minds around. But what the argument is here is that don't be misled by the by the terminology "spirit body" as though it, it lacks definite form and shape and constitution. Again, what Paul is getting at based upon, again, the embodiment language for the glory of God back in the Old Testament, is that we're, we're going to have bodies, okay? But, but, but our bodies are going to be like the, the, you know, the way God was embodied, whatever that stuff was, and the way Christ was embodied after the resurrection, whatever that stuff was. It's corporeal, but it's not what we have now. It's different. It's superior. It's transcendent. It has a whole set of different properties as opposed to what we have now. We're going to put off what we have now, the body of the, of the dust that returns to dust, that is corruptible. And we're going to put on this new body and this different kind of flesh. So just to kind of summarize you know, where, where we are at to this point, think, think about the, the, the chain of thought here. Paul talks about the resurrected Christ. Okay, being a life-giving spirit. But he also talks about Christ having a heavenly body. And he also talks about him having or being the glory, having a body of glory, uh, like the glory of the Lord. All of these, all of these terms, again, are complementary. They are synonymous in that respect. Paul is using different terms not to describe different bodies that Jesus, like, like a change of clothes. You know, Jesus, you know, he wears this one one day and that one another day. No, all of these phrases are describing essentially the same thing. It is a post-resurrection corporeality. Okay, that's what it is. So the believer, again, the believer's conformity to the image of the, the heavenly man, to use Paul's terminology, who is pneuma and who also is glory, that our conformity to that involves receiving and becoming the same kind of body. And again, that's made explicit in Philippians 3.21. So if, if we take Again, Philippians 3.21 at face value, what it says is that Christ's resurrection body is, again, this, this glorious body that, that we saw back in the Old Testament. That's what that stuff is, and that's what we're going to inherit. So we can't think of pneuma just as formless spirit. Now, the Corinthians, of course, and other people asked, well, can we talk about what sort of nature of stuff that that is? 
And we get that obviously in First Corinthians 15, uh, throughout the whole passage, you know, beginning in, in, in 35, Paul writes, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish persons, Paul says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. And Paul using an agrarian analogy. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. So Paul's saying, look, you know, lots of things are embodied, you know, but there's different kinds of embodiment. Human, humanity, animal kingdom, you know, plants, all this kind of stuff. It's not just, again invisible, formless spirit. Things are embodied. Verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, Paul says, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What we have now, what God's given to us now is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised in a spiritual body, or a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. It's just a different kind of embodiment, is what he's saying. You don't go from a body to a non-body when you're in heaven. You go from one kind of embodiment to another kind of embodiment, is what Paul is saying. So even spirit beings who are you know, dead now have some kind of embodiment. And this is the way that believers, dead believers, or even dead unbelievers are described. They're described in embodiment terms. Transfiguration, you know, the, the, the three you know, inner circle disciples see Moses and Elijah. Okay, well, how do they know they are? They're not spirits. They're not just wisps of smoke or something. They have embodiment. There are different kinds of embodiment. As Paul's point here in 1 Corinthians 15, you keep going, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving pneuma, life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. You get the natural body first, then you get the spiritual body. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of man of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We're going to trade in one form of embodiment for another form of embodiment. Again, it's it's tough for us to wrap our minds around that, but this is what this is actually what Paul's saying. So I want to look at, at another thing. I think that uh, you know Litwa has here is is helpful. Again, just just to summarize things, he says uh, Paul characterizes the pneumatic body. This is page one twenty nine by incorruptibility, glory and power. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 43. All of these are divine qualities. It is also conformed to Christ, who is both a life-making spirit, and he's also from heaven. The nature of the spirit body is heavenly. In verse 48, it is not, Paul adds, made up of flesh and blood. I mean, Paul actually says it's not made of flesh and blood. The constituents of the present bodily life, okay, that's verses 48 and 50. The, this remark is especially striking and has troubled many a church father, Litmus says. Most ancients admitted that all bodily life on earth is constituted by flesh, by which it was meant not only skin, but bones, arteries, muscle, nerves, and all the various tissues and organs that make life possible on this planet. Flesh is the stuff of terrestrial life. Mortals are those that have blood in their veins, and this blood is conceived of as being produced by their eating of grain. That was a quote, you know, from another scholar summarizing this back to Litwa. He says, to exist in a body without flesh is not to be human in the way the ancients normally conceived of it. In other words, the, the ancients were so tied into this thinking that if, if, you, if you had a discussion with them about disembodiment, there's no embodiment at all. And again, you're just a wisp of something or, a, or you know, light, light rays or something like that. They would say, well, you're no longer human then. You can't be human. You have to have some kind of embodiment, whether it's the embodiment of this terrestrial life or some, some other embodiment. Humans have to have bodies, no matter where they are, what stage of life or death. You just have to have, to have embodiment uh, again. And 
it, it's something we often don't really think about those things, at least consciously. But if you think about the way you think about, you know, departed loved ones, you know, if they're with the Lord, you think about them uh, as they looked. You think about them doing things. You think about them interacting with, you know, with, with the Lord or with, you know, other, other people who've gone on before them. All of that takes a body. So we 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 still you know we're we're part of this thinking even though you know we we don't really kind of sit down and sort of mull it over but when we think about these things we we actually still do think of them in embodiment terms and that's that's Litwa's point it's Paul's point this is this is just this is the way it is it's the way we think it's the way it is it's the way all the ancients thought and again Paul's just using he's 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 borrowing this language and of course sort of upping the ante when he links it back to the glory the embodied glory, you know, that, that God had in in that corporeal form. So again, it, it, th- these are hard things to again wrap our minds around, but they they are actually you know kind of important, you know, for understanding what Paul you know are trying to process, you know, what uh, what Paul is thinking. Uh, Litwa adds to continue: if the pneumatic body is a body made up of pneuma, question arises: well, what what in the physics of Paul's day was that? What was pneuma? And again, he he has a whole. He goes back into Stoic philosophers. There were long discussions of what this stuff was made of. In other words, how how do we describe this stuff? How is it different from the flesh that normal you know humans have? And so he goes through a whole sort of you know whole listing of references and whatnot to you know people like Cicero who were talking about you know, what, what this was. So there was a lot of, you know, speculation naturally uh, about it. But the larger point is that Paul, again, is going to be familiar with a lot of this vocabulary, a lot of this, again, sort of, sort of thinking. Now to take it back in a Jewish direction, another, another little excerpt here uh, from Litwa, he writes, Stoic beliefs seem to have found their way into first century Judaism. According to Essene belief, it, as it was reported by Josephus, souls emanate from the finest ether, is, this, is the quote. When released from the flesh, these ether souls are thus naturally born upward. When counseling his comrades, Josephus apparently reports his own view about souls. They are immortal, and they can be called a portion of God. In other words, they, they, they share in this, this corporeality. In a speech of Titus, which likely presents Josephus' own views, the historian asks, for what brave man knows not that souls released from the flesh by the sword on the battlefield are hospitably welcomed by that purest of elements, the ether, and placed among the stars. Again, now this star language, I don't want to rabbit trail too much, but this this thing about him, and we even read it in, in Paul when he talks about the glory of the sun, the glory of the stars, you know, being different than other glories and other bodies. Uh, if you remember back to the interview with David Burnett, this is part of glorification thinking more broadly in the Jewish world, that that the the descendants of Abraham, and that's believers in New Testament language, according to Galatians 3. Uh, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Will, those believers will become like the stars. Now, that doesn't mean we, we turn into a rock and, and we, we float around and twinkle, okay? What that actually means, again, if you tie that to Paul's language here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, and, this, and Paul brings it up again, he actually references the glory of the stars in verse 41. What it means is we become divine. Okay, it's deification language, it's divinization language, it's glorification language, whatever whatever term you like, scholars use them all. It's theosis, okay, it's it's becoming divine. And what that means in turn is that we get new embodiment. And that embodiment is the stuff of which, you know, the gods are made, or the stuff that God was made of when he interacts with humans. Again, this this glory body that we see referenced in Ezekiel 1 and in Exodus. You know, hey, the, the angel of the Lord, you know, who that was that was Yahweh embodied. That guy was made of something, okay? Is that that's the idea. And whatever whatever he was made of, well that that's that's what, you know, the 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 guy sitting on the throne in Ezekiel 1, that that's that's what he was made of and that's what Jesus resurrection body was made of. And that's what we will be made of. Again, that you have to follow the sort of the logic chain, connecting all these ideas and all these passages again to to get this 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 flavor of divinization when it comes to Paul's quote spirit body talk. Now, again, it doesn't really you know we we can't you know our propensity here because we're moderns as well. Hey, I'd like I'd like a DNA sample. You know, I want to I want to I want to know what how many chromosomes that has. Uh, I, I want to know you know what you know, what the genetic material looks like, what the gene sequences are, and all that kind of stuff. Again, these are modern scientific concepts that nobody is aware of and nobody's thinking about when they write this stuff. What they're able to communicate is the notion that after death, 
especially again as believers, but you know, after death, we don't just sort of become electricity. We don't just sort of become formless, substanceless entities. Okay. We are embodied in a new way. And the people living in Jesus' day who actually saw and touched his resurrected body, okay, know that our future embodiment is going to be physical and corporeal. And whatever that body was, that's the one we're going to get. That much they could communicate. And that, again, was not a revolutionary idea in principle. Again, Paul ups the ante like like biblical writers do so often. They'll take they'll take something that is conceptually familiar to their readers, both Jew and Gentile in this case. And and if, if they're Jews, again the startling part is that he links it back to the glory, the, the embodied glory. Uh and he links that to Jesus. So it's another it's another one of these backdoor references, backdoor reminders that hey Jesus was Yahweh here in, in human form. He, incarnation and if in fact he still is because now he he he's, he has the same kind of embodiment. You know, there's still this connection. So that hasn't been lost, you know. So again, they're they're able to communicate these sorts of ideas, but it it's really apples and oranges thinking for us to to want a to genetic sequencing. And 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 I bring that up because you know I I get these questions about the sons of God and embodiment and Genesis six and all this sort of stuff. Well, how does that work? Hey, the answer is I don't know how it works, and nobody else does either. And the, and the sub answer to that is we're never told. Okay, what we are told is that the Nephilim and their descendants, the Anakim and the Rephaim, they're they're described as men. Why? Because that's what they look like. They're embodied. What else would you call them? You wouldn't call them plants. You wouldn't call them trees. You wouldn't call them fill in the the, the blank with an animal. They are human in form. They are embodied. They are corporeal. And in their case, of course, they could die. Okay, so you know they're 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 actually closer to the you know to the that kind of embodiment that is totally human. You know to you know than than, than something like you know the, the post resurrection appearance or what what awaits you know the the destiny of the believer. So you know I don't I don't know how it how it all works. All I can do is to, is take the language that they describe that they use. And say, well, here's how, how why they would have used that term. Hey, don't forget in in Genesis 19, angels. Genesis 19:1, the, the, the two visitors to Sodom and Gomorrah are specifically called angels. They're also described as men in the same chapter. Why? Well, that's what they look like. Okay, does that mean they're just human? Are they more than human? Are they like a different kind of? You know, I don't know. They're angels. They're embodied. So you have again offspring of the sons of you have the sons of God. They're divine beings, but they're also embodied. Their offspring are not. You know they're 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 human, but they're but they're seem to be a little bit more, a little bit different than human. Well, you know, I want the genetic sequence for that. You know, and so we can trace the genetic. Co- Scripture knows nothing of this language, nothing of these concepts, nothing of this talk. And you know, again, when it comes to the, the whole Nephilim bloodline thing, look, the, the the point of having the Nephilim stories end with the line of Goliath. Okay, the messaging there is that this line is is dead. It's gone. It's died out. It's not it's not here anymore. Because the cities of the Philistines was where the, the remnants of the Anakim fled after the conquest. We're told that, and then we're, we, the story picks up with Goliath and his brothers, and they all die. They are all wiped out. Mission accomplished, finally, during the time of David. So to, to take 21st century technology and, again, try to analyze things there, that is not the message given to us in the text. The text does not inform us that there's quote unquote genetic material floating around in our genes that are from the Nephilim. It knows nothing of that at all. So that can't be intentionally telegraphed in the Bible. All that we're given is the language of embodiment, pure and simple, both in terms of the dark side, in terms of again the resurrection body, in terms of the bodies we'll get. Just that 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 that's where that's where the scriptural road ends. Okay, we will be embodied. It'll be different than what we have now. In fact, it will be the body, a body like Jesus had. So the, the, the short answer is, what is the spiritual body? What is celestial flesh? You know, what, what is this? It's the body Jesus had. And it, it's, it's being, and what that means is it's being made of the same stuff as that body. I can't give you the genetic sequence. I can't talk in DNA terms about it. Okay. Because the scripture doesn't as well. Just know that it speaks of 
embodiment and being conformed to the image of Christ for Paul. I think this is another big takeaway here is that it's not just our character. It's not just our internal disposition. Again, being being what, what Jesus's was so that we don't rebel, we don't sin. And, and all that's true, but it's more than that. Being conformed to the image of Christ is language designed to inform us that you're going to get that body. You're going to get a body just like he had after the resurrection. So in every way, you will be conformed to what he is. In every way. Okay, you will have his inner disposition. You will have his body. You will be so like him that you will be, again, fit for this kind of existence, you know, in, in the presence of God in the afterlife. And again, you know, we, we don't have to worry about all of these problems, both in terms of spiritual problems and in terms of, the, of the, the problems associated with the body of dust. We don't have to worry about either side of this in the afterlife, in glory. Mike, as long as I don't have to do cardio, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, you won't you won't have to get get your blood moving because you won't have any of that. Yeah, that's <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> look, look, it's, it's the it's the perfect prescription for laziness. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah. All right, Mike. Well, that was a good one. I I enjoyed that one. Well, good. Uh, did you want to mention? We're going to switch gears here. Did you want to mention yeah. about your Michigan trip that's coming up here? Yeah, yeah. Just just a reminder to podcast listeners again. Uh, that I will be in Hazel Park, Michigan, from uh, I'm speaking on on uh, Saturday the fifth, the fifth of March, in Hazel Park, Michigan, and also on the following Sunday morning uh, as well. I'll be doing you know, part of the service, or I guess I'll be the speaker in the service on the sixth. If you want to know what the location is, what the church is, you got to go to the website. Just go to drmsh.com/events. Or in the drop-down menu, the speaking schedule uh, on uh, at the About tab, it'll drop down to speaking schedule. You can find the information there. But that is Hazel Park, Michigan. That's a suburb. I'm, I'm told very you know part of the the surroundings of Detroit. So if you're in the area, try to make it over to one of those one of those two things. Uh, I can tell you right now on the Sunday event, I'll probably have to you know, leave right after the service to, to go catch a plane. But on Saturday, Saturday is a lot more flexible. So if you can make uh, either one, you know, add that to your calendar and then introduce yourself. Mike, can you give us a preview of next week's topic, Heavenly Tablets? Yeah, well, boy, I, I don't want to get into, into too many specifics, but we're going to be discussing tablets and books again, which ties into, again, this 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 idea of having a record uh, by which uh, individuals are judged, you know, Again, all the all the sort of familiar uh, kinds of you know motifs that we're we're associated with that. But that again, I, what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to I'm going to go through again the sort of the Second Temple Jewish tradition uh, where it has its you know antecedents and where it where it's picked up in the New Testament to sort of get a fuller picture of what would have been in the mind of the New Testament writers when they are talking about that sort of stuff. Uh, again, it, it has there, there's a backstory to all of it. It, it. It's not just something that John made up when he was, you know, writing in the book, you know, the book of Revelation, for instance. It has a backstory, and then, uh, you know, subsequent to that, you know, the, the next one we'll just go two episodes deep here. We're going to be talking about something related, but the the whole uh, the phrase, you know, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And again, what what the backdrop is to that, and. Not surprisingly, and some some listeners probably already sense this that that has something to do with the watchers, you know, in the abyss, you know, who were you know imprisoned after the Genesis six event, you know, the the whole Enochian uh, way of laying that out, which of course again has deep Mesopotamian roots because the if you've read Unseen Realm, you know that the uh, the offenders there, the Apkalo, of course, became part of the underworld, but all of that stuff again, all of that stuff contributes to or is is lurking in the background of John's statement about. The Lake of Fire being, you know, created for the devil and his angels. So those are the next two episodes. So that it's sort of eschatological stuff uh, without doing sort of the traditional end times eschatology thing, even though we'll be we'll be touching on some of that, but some of the more particular stuff about judgment and, and whatnot. Sounds good. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's it. All right. I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. 
Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.